pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Morning. We got a lot here, so we're going to we're going to move pretty quickly on it. Uh, start with the consent agenda. We have the approval of payroll June 23rd and July 7th, 2023. Approval of claims July 22nd, June uh, June 29th, and July 7th, 2023. And approval of minutes of June 13th, 2023. We move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Push and approve. Uh, before we get into the memorial law process, I'm going to move, um, Jim, if you want to come up here, highway up here, uh, we're going to open the bids, get this out of the way so we can get a recommendation before the end of our meeting. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> Explain to everybody real quick what we're doing here. Uh, we're opening the bids for the uh, $2 million CCMG projects for paving. Okay. Um, so we'll go through those, make sure the lowest responsible bidder, and as soon as we get it figured out here during the meeting, we'll let you know so we can have you award the contract. So get moving on it. This is a bid? No, that's just who submitted. Oh. Those are what we're opening. Oh, I see, I'm sorry. <clears throat> That looks like we've had uh, two bidders, uh, Milestone con uh, Contractors, North Inc., uh, and Reith Riley Construction Company, Inc. Ready? Ready Total amount from Milestone Contractors is $1,779,788.07. Could you read that twice? One million seven hundred ninety-nine. That was a test. Go ahead. Well, I forgot. <laughs> seven cents. <No. laughs> um, with Reith Riley, the amount is one million seven hundred forty-eight thousand two hundred forty-seven dollars and four cents. Uh, milestone contractors, North. Where are they out of? That's, uh, used to be Walsh Kelly. The, uh, uh, they're owned by uh, Heritage Group, and Heritage Group used to have two separate paving contract companies. And they just them all so you're going to take a look, take those in the back, and take a look at it and get back to this. Yep. We'll raise sure your hand when you're ready, and I'll throw you in here. We'll do, sir. Thank you. Um, Memorial Opera House, Scott. <coughs> Morning. Morning. How are you? I'm well, how about you? Good. This isn't Good. your last meeting, is it? I think it might be, no. uh, depending on when the August one is scheduled. So, because I'm. We have a July meeting. We have another meeting in July? Then, no, it's not. <laughs> Just make sure you're here. Not I will. Not that easy. All right, what do you got for us? Uh, this is for Christy Weiss for Little Shop of Horrors. She's coming on. We are renting uh, the plants for the show. She's coming on just basically to make sure that the puppeteers and that the plants are taken good care of so that we don't have to send anything back damaged. Okay. So we got Chris Weiss, Little Shop of Horrors. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cost here is two, $250. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Scott, do we need a motion to approve this? Yes. I move that we approve the artistic services agreement for Chris Spice for Little Shop of Horrors for $250. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, announcements. Uh, we are seeking applications uh, to the Airport Authority Board. Uh, the applic uh, applicant must be a Democrat affiliation the application deadline is August 3rd, 2023. So again, we are seeking applications for the uh, Airport Authority Board, and, the, and your political affiliation must be a Democrat, and the deadline is August 3rd. Memorial Opera House. Barb? I just wanted to give an update as to where we are on that. Um, at our May morning meeting, 
We voted uh, unanimously to approve a scope for renovations for the Opera House that was going to be somewhere under $5 million, um, and that it would be covered by an allocation of, of the $5 million of ARP monies. Uh, then at our, <clears throat> we took that to the council meeting at the end of May and had uh, Scott McDonald there, Jeff Lewis from the foundation, and we talked about the scope. At that point in time, we met with Schmidt and Skillman and had them prepare proposals, which we then voted on unanimously at our last morning meeting. We did take that to the council at their uh, June meeting, which they um, voted down four to zero. So we thought that was dead, but uh, it appears that Councilman Sims is going to try to get that appropriated at their next meeting on the 18th of this month. So just wanted to give an update on that. Well, the vote was, to be correct, the vote was four to two. Four to two. What did I say? Four to nothing. Oh, I'm sorry. Four to, yeah. four to two. I apologize. That's right. Okay. Is that it? Yep. Okay. And then we have an update on the sheriff's residence as well? Yes. Um, we did go to the RDC to request a $120,000 loan to renovate the first floor of the sheriff's residence, and that was approved. And the $120,000 will go towards the kitchenette, uh, replace or putting the first floor restroom back in, and also for the first floor air conditioning. Uh, we did. Uh, work with Scott to put together an ad which went out to the papers last week and essentially the uh, the bid has to be somewhere between $1,902.85 and $2,083 and the fair market value was let's see $2,003 per month uh, we're going to be doing a walkthrough on July 26th at 10 a.m. for any interested parties looking to lease the property. The space will, the, the, the lease term will be three years and it will be available no earlier than January 1st, 2024. That does include the lessee paying all utilities. I'm sorry. Uh, that does include the lessee paying all the utilities. Do you have any questions on that? I do not. Laura, you have any questions? Nope. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, the, under commission's, commissioner's business, we have a proposal for a new mail machine in the admin building, the amount of $265.65 per month. And the company is Quadient Pulse Technology. Need a vote on that, don't we, Scott? We do. I'll entertain a motion. I move that we approve the Quadrant Pulse Technology proposal for a new mail machine in the admin building and the amount of two sixty-five sixty-five per month. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Is Lee here? I am. Oh. Am I pronouncing that right, Quadiet? I think so. Okay. <clears throat> Nobody seems to know. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Quadiant Pulse Technology, a proposal for a new uh, mail machine in the courthouse in the amount of $265.65 per month. I'll entertain a motion. I move that we approve the Quadiant Pulse Technology proposal for a new mail machine at the courthouse in the amount of $265.65 per month. Your second? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Uh, we have a resolution for a venue rental policy. Uh, uh, Scott. So the revised proposed uh, Venue policy uh, has. Uh, we had our administration meeting. I believe it was Thursday morning or Friday morning of last week, where we discussed this. The proposal from that discussion uh, that we had at that administration meeting would have that for any event that alcohol is served, the county venue should provide every patron with an identifier that sign that signifies the patron has been legally served alcohol. Uh, that identifier could be a wristband, a hand stamp, or 
a lanyard badge of some kind. The patrons of the during the event would be required to wear that uh, while drinking alcoholic beverages. Um, and then for all events, self-described or self-defined as adult intended by the promoter. Individuals 17 years and older will be permitted without, without a parent or guardian. Individuals 16 years and younger should shall only be admitted with parent or guardian, and the promoter shall advertise the event the event as intended for adults, so the public is aware of what the intention is. Laurie, is there anything you would like to add to this? I'll entertain a motion to, to put this in as policy. Do we have a number on this? I don't know. We're I'll have to pull a number. Yeah, we'll yeah it's good. It's the next, it's 23 dash, whatever our next resolution is. Good morning. I can go pull it. I'm going to go pull a number right now. That's not that as part of the motion? No. Okay. I move that we approve the resolution of the Porter County Board of Commissioners for the mandatory rental policy provisions for all Porter County government venues. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Uh, puppy mill ordinance. <clears throat> Scott? So that we've been talking about this since the beginning of the year and the state is kind of uh, on hold for now so we're able to move on with our proposal uh, the, this would be a prohibition on the retail sale of dogs cats or rabbits by pet shops it shall be unlawful for a pet shop to sell or offer to sell a dog cat or rabbit a pet shop shall provide space for the display of dogs cats or rabbits that are available for adoption only if such animals are displayed and made available for adoption by an animal rescue organization and all the following conditions are met. Uh, no part of any fees associated with the display or adoption of the animals including but not limited to adoption fees or fees for the provision of space shall be paid by the host pet shop or to any entity affiliated with or under common ownership with the post pet, oh, excuse me, with the uh, host pet shop. So basically this, uh, this is a prohibition from the concern uh, of the, uh, for lack of a better term, puppy mills. Um, some of the whereas clauses that I put together was most puppies, kittens, and rabbits sold in pet stores come from large scale commercial breeding facilities where the health and welfare of the animals is disregarded in order to maximize profit. Uh, according to the Humane Society of the United States, an estimated 10,000 puppy mills produce more than 2 million puppies per, uni per year in the United States. The documented abuses are endemic to puppy, kitten, and rabbit mills include overbreeding, inbreeding, uh, minimal veterinary care, lack of adequate food, water, and shelter, lack of socialization, exercise, enrichment, lack of sanita sanitation. Uh, at the end of the day, these things cause lots of problems once they're put into the system and people buy them, whether they're able to care for them, whether they're healthy, whether they are carrying any other diseases that are problems for other people that have their animals in a, in a different manner. So uh, there's lots of problems that have come with this. This is why there's been somewhat of a movement across Indiana to have this put together. Uh, so it basically reduced the cost of Porter County and its residents and protects the citizens who may purchase dogs, cats, or rabbits. So th to be clear, this doesn't stop someone from being able to buy a dog from a dog breeder. What it does stop, so not all, people that are breeding dogs on farms and things like that, this is not and all affecting them. What this affects is the f places we don't see uh, that are producing puppies or rabbits in vast quantities for the sole purpose of putting them in retail uh, settings for sale. That's where the problem exists. Uh, there hasn't been a problem with the individual small dog breeders or rabbit breeders. Those are in no way, I believe, what any of these commissioners are attempting to get in the way of or, ch or, or change. Uh, this is really for that retail uh, portion that I think we've all over the years have gained some knowledge of seeing and feeling and touching and being a part of and know that uh, there could be some significant problems if they weren't some significant regulation, which is not uh, current in our state. So I think and this Scott, is the next best thing. And Scott, from your perspective, you don't know of any retail establishment currently that this would affect? Well, it wouldn't affect any current. So if there is a, if there is a retail um, 
business happening and unincorporated, that, that this would not change that. We don't get to go back and right. change the law um, retroactively. However, it would stop future. Well, we're, we're not aware of any problem in the unincorporated it now, though. I am, I'm not. Even though it wouldn't stop, we're not aware of any problem. Correct. Well, I totally support it, and I thank Laura for bringing it to our attention, getting us to this point. So. And I think, and don't forget, this is first reading. Okay. Public hearing. All right. So we're going to close our public, uh, our close our commissioners' meeting here, uh, and open it up to the public um, for the first reading. So any anyone who would like uh, to speak in favor of this ordinance, step forward. Anyone who would like to speak in favor of this ordinance, step forward. Third and final call. Anyone who would like to speak in favor of this ordinance, step forward. Anyone who would like to speak against this ordinance, step forward. Second call. Any Anyone who would like to speak against this ordinance, step forward. Third and final call. Anyone who would like to speak against this ordinance, please step forward. Close, open it back up to the commissioners. I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to pass the ordinance amending chapter 12, health and safety by the addition of article eight, prohibition on the retail sale of dogs, cats, or rabbits by pet shops on first reading. I second. So we have a motion and a second to approve. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. <laughs> motion approved. We have our second reading at our, at our um, what is our, uh, Kathy, what is our date of our next meeting? Well, we have the one in July, at the end of July, um, the, um, I'm sorry, 20, Monday the 24th. Yeah, Monday, it's the 24th. Monday the 24th, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Public works projects discussion. I ask that we have this on the agenda. Um, I think it's important that we move this forward. We had ANZ here presenting the um, issues, uh, along with Jim Polar, the issues in our public works facilities. And I think it's important that we um, get the project designed and bid out so we have an understanding of the dollars that we're looking at. And I'm not exactly sure what we need to do uh, in terms of moving that forward and passing that on to the council. Well, I think that I would like to ask Scott to draft uh, a memo to the county council um, uh, asking them uh, or letting them know of our of our uh, want of, of moving this along because we're running out of time here. I just want to make sure that all 10 of us are on the same the same thought uh, process here is to we also will need some money appropriated right if I recall right. it was pretty expensive right. Mm -hmm. right. yep so we are we look at just to be clear are we talking about I mean ultimately we're talking about either architect money or bond money well we're, we're talking separate or together <laughs> together we're talking about Moving the bond along, the, the discussion with the bond, and and, and, pr and preparation of of uh, processing that that new bond. Okay. What needs to be done? Well, is that a separate conversation? I was going to suggest that at our next meeting we also have some sort of a resolution from Scott that we are backing the rolling over of the bond that's about to mature at the end of this year. So uh, I was going to have that as a separate conversation about the bond. And that's why I was asking. But we kind of have to know what we're going to spend the bond money on in order to do that. Right? I mean, that's a requirement, correct? But we need to know which project or projects. Well, it's both projects. Um, there, I mean, there's no, unless some, somebody wants to discuss that. I mean, it's always been my understanding was we're looking at both projects here simultaneously. So, so um, I don't know, whatever the board, the pleasure of the board is, is, is what you want Scott to reach out to him about. Is either appropriating the money to, to get uh, the necessary information back so we know what we're looking at here in the way of costs, or just, or just preparing to move this bond 
bond forward? Because I think we can move the bond forward without identifying the exact cost at this point, can't we? We can. We can. But projects, we have. We, to, we have okay. to be able to say that. I mean, at the end, the bond is one project's eighteen point three. More than one projects can more than one project can be a total of twenty five. So, if uh, when we say projects, I mean what we're really talking about is if we're doing a bond that's for twenty five million, it's by default going to be at least more than one project. So we're going to be at two projects to be at twenty five million. So I believe the commissioners want the twenty five million dollar bond moved forward. But my only question is: Is there a request from the commissioners to have? separate from the bond architect money not or separate. is the architect money within the bond not separate from the bond but not telling the council how to fund that but i we at as commissioners have not yet approved either um the jail project or the public works project and that's what i was i i don't know exactly how we move that project forward and alert the council that we want them uh, to include both of those projects in in their discussions, I think we need to have conversations with the council ourselves. We we've had those conversations. As a matter of fact, I, I just uh, met recently with uh, Board President uh, Revis last week. I don't I don't I think it's a mistake on our end if we let if we don't move the bond forward. We can have these these conversations. You know, at, at the same time, but they, or maybe even a little later, but we have to begin setting the table to move this bond forward because we're running out of time. So, um, so we'll, the letter will be, uh, it can be in the form of a resolution or a letter from uh, the executive that are, we're asking for the county council to consider passing a $25 million bond and then. Um, 18.3 would be for one project. The remaining portion after the bond cost would be for the second project. Well, is that necessarily true, though? Until we know the project timelines, uh, we don't know what amount of money will be for each project until we understand the, so that bubble in terms of where each project falls within that bond. But don't we first have to don't we have to vote on each of those projects that we are in favor of moving those forward? Each of those products, don't we have to vote on that? You can vote on that, but normally what happens, the reason why we're feeling out of place is because normally we have plans and we approve the plans and move it forward to the council. Mm -hmm. We don't have plans to approve and move forward to the council. So not to get caught in semantics, but having A and Z here present and then the commissioners go and have it presented to council. I'm not sure that our message that we want to do a bond is lost. I mean, I believe we've communicated that. I, beyond having a motion, a second, and a vote to do the projects, we can do that. But that's why we feel out of place a little bit. It's because normally we have a set of plans and we say, yep, this is what we want to do. Here's the estimated cost. The commissioners approve it. It goes to the council. The council then uh, does their fiscal portion of it. So that's why I'm asking the questions. Is that? And can I stop you for once? I mean, we haven't approved the architect yet either. No, no. So we can. I mean, even today. I mean, we can do a motion that we the co the commissioners can make a motion that they want to proceed with a 25 million dollar bond. Uh, the amounts to be determined at a later date as to which projects, but I mean to how much to each project, but the projects are the uh, jail, the, the uh, Porter County Highway Center District Garage, and the uh, jail remodel. So moved. That's a motion. We have a second. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Got it? That's it. All right. So now I will do, you want a resolution or a letter? Let's do a resolution. We'll do a resolution. I'll prepare a resolution for the next meeting that will be requesting the bond. Same pages then, it doesn't matter. Oh yeah, one, six of one half does the other. It means the same thing. What's that? Resolution or a letter. I mean, we don't have yeah. to approve a resolution, right? That's Let's the write a letter if we need to hurry. No, we don't have to approve them. Um, so... 
let's from not the complicate council perspective, this. What, what, what would they prefer to see, a resolution or a letter? Does it make any difference? And we I have to approve a resolution. I think, you're gonna get, I think we're going to get let's the same response. The okay. I think you're going to get the same response. Okay, let's mm -hmm. just do the letter then. All right, so I'll do a letter asking for the $25 million bond to be processed this year for those two projects. Okay. Uh, before we, we move to the jail projects discussion, uh, Jim let is give me uh, a heads up that they're ready for the recommendation. Thank you. Um, after reviewing all the documents, we recommend uh, the commissioners approve Reith Riley construction out of Gary, Indiana for the amount of one point one. Million seven hundred forty-eight thousand two hundred forty-seven dollars and four cents. At the lowest bid. That was the lowest responsible bid. Correct. Right. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to. Uh, Reith Riley Construction. Yes. And uh, any discussion. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Thank you. Painless. Jail project discussion. Actually. Thanks, the, Jim. Actually. The only thing I wanted to do is the same thing, is that we, but it sounds like we're going to do that with the letter that Scott. Okay, good. We'll move on. Ordinance for a non-reverting fund for sheriff's residence, money from the RDC, uh, and uh, lease payments uh, first reading. This is just the fund that the lease payments uh, from the uh, sheriff's residence uh, would be deposited into this proposed on reverting fund in order to uh, pay back the redevelopment commission for the loan to do the improvements which we're dealing with next on the agenda. Why don't you real quick explain what this is all about, the Reader's Digest version, <laughs> to the public that isn't, uh, isn't aware of it. Okay, so the RDC, the Redevelopment Commission, has approved a loan of $120,000 to um, the commissioners to renovate the first floor of the sheriff's residence and once we start receiving lease payments at the beginning of the year of 2024 those payments will be going into this fund and then at some periodic interval we will be repaying the RDC and that loan repayment will occur over a five-year period of time after that money has been repaid back to the RDC, this fund will continue in perpetuity for future lease payments, and those funds would be available for any additional improvements to the sheriff's residence. Okay. All right, we'll, uh, I'll close the commissioner's meeting, open it up. I'll start with any, anyone opposing this uh, ordinance, please step forward. Anyone opposing this ordinance, please step forward. Third and final call. Anyone opposing this ordinance, please step forward. Thank you. Any Anyone wanting to speak in favor of this ordinance, please step forward. Anyone? So this is wildly popular. Nobody cares. Uh, second uh, call, uh, anyone wanting to speak in favor of this ordinance? Third and final call, anyone wanting to speak in favor of this ordinance? Thank you. Close it back in to the commissioner's uh, meeting. I move, that we motion. I move that we approve the ordinance for a non-reverting fund for the sheriff's residence for money from the lease payments on first reading. We have a second. Second. I'll second that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same aye. sign. Those opposed, same sign. I got an aye from uh, Laura. Motion approved. Uh, we have an agreement uh, to represent Porter County Board of Commissioners regarding the solar ordinance from Haller Co. Oh, 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 MOU. Uh, no, I didn't miss anything. Did we do that one already? Okay. We just did it. Oh, I'm sorry. No. I talked about it, but we didn't. I talked about it because of the non-reverting fund being created for oh, the okay. lease. Okay. But the actual loan between the RDC and the commissioners is number nine. 
should say. Okay. So we have the MOU between the RDC and the commissioners. This is the uh, the commissioners meeting portion uh, for the, a memorandum of understanding between the Porter County Commissioners and the Porter County Redevelopment Commission loan for 153 South Franklin Valparaiso. This will have the RDC making a, up to $120,000 available to the Porter County Commissioners for building improvements at 153 South Franklin. Uh, the Porter County Commissioner will invoice uh, we'll submit invoices to the RDC, and the RDC shall have caused the same to be paid. And then from the rental income uh, produced by the property will be paid back to the RDC um, beginning in 2024 and would be uh, over a five-year term. Okay. I move that we approve the MOA, MOU between the RDC and the commissioners. We have a second. I'll second that. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Aye. Motion approved. Okay. Number 10, uh, agreement to uh, represent Porter County Board of Commissioners regarding the solar ordinance uh, from Haller Colvin Attorney. Scott? Yeah, we're having uh, additional counsel uh, uh, be proposed to be hired to aid in the uh, ongoing uh, solar ordinance rewrites. Um, and any litigation that we might find ourselves in. I move that we approve the agreement to represent Porter County Board of Commissioners regarding the solar ordinance with Haller Colvin, attorney. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. <clears throat> Opportunity Enterprises presentation on how the ARP money was spent. Morning, gentlemen. PowerPoints as well for us today. Um, thank you, commissioners, for the time to uh, explain what we've utilized the money for. Do you uh, want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Neil Samon, CEO of Opportunity Enterprises, and I brought Mark Fisher with, our CFO. Um, he's here to um, advise me after 45 minutes that I only have 15 minutes left uh, to explain to you all the amazing things that are going on. Way to go, uh, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if we will, so rather simple, I, I guess, in theory, um, really appreciate the dollars that were given to us when we applied for um, these funds, um, the use of which was to um, utilize those dollars for um, revenue that we lost, you know, during that time. Uh, the first couple of slides we're going to illustrate is some of that loss and the significance of that loss during that time. Uh, but then what I'd like to do, and I'll, I'll try to make it quick. Uh, but just kind of illustrate what that's been able to allow us to do um, since, you know, the onset of COVID, you know, even though um, it certainly was a um, disastrous time for everybody, an impactful time. I, I think it's also been um, a time for us to um, even reimagine what Opportunity Enterprises um, will be in the future. And I, I will say that as well, as some of this direction um, is, is coming from the state and federal government as well. Um, and how agencies such as Opportunity Enterprises will deliver services in the future. Um, I think we're in front of that a bit um, and looking forward to the future and what that means. Um, so uh, we'll kind of go through some of those numbers real quickly. So the impact of the initial impact of, of COVID, um, right, is our needing to um, cease operations for our day services. Um, and that is where our clients come to our facility and we're providing them a meaningful day through curriculum and various enriching um, programs. If you take a look at those numbers, those are the hours served in the various years. Um, I'll call the COVID years. This has also been a bit of a um, revisiting, um, a little, um, yeah, reimagining or reliving the trauma of these, <laughs> these numbers. So you can take a look, it's rather significant, especially that, that first year, 2020, the drop in number of hours served. Um, and it's starting to recover 2021, 2022. If you go on to the next slide, you can see what that impact was um, financially from where we were at in 2019 uh, for these services, uh, that initial impact um, in 2020, um, and then starting to recover, you know, and again, those, those following years in, in um, what I call again, the COVID years, uh, from 1.8 to under a million, 800,000, 
uh, then crawling back to 1.2, 1.3. So we're still not back to where, you know, we were, um, and there's various reasons for that, right? Some of us that we did lose some clients. Some are the clients aren't ready to come back yet. Uh, so various factors. So this is a major area, again, that we utilize that $850,000 plus to cover lost revenue. Uh, the next um, area was, go to the next slide, is respite. Uh, this, this is a service that is provided to, essentially it's a service provided to the caregiver. Right, so um, as caregivers need relief, um, as they're caring for their son or daughter with a disability, they utilize these services. The services that we provide uh, can be anywhere from a handful of hours um, to two weeks um, at, a, at our respite facility. A lot of it is community activity. Um, you might see us out in the community going to Railcats games or the Opera House um, or out to dinner. Um, so during that time, you know, the service for the, the parents or caregivers is that, that break in time. You can see in 2019, we're at 47,000 hours. Um, the immediate impact in 2020 was dropping to uh, under 30,000. Uh, then again, crawling our way back 2021, 2022. Um, if you look at the next slide, again, you'll see the financial impact of, of what that is to the agency. 2019, we're at $1.1 million uh, in that um, service line. Uh, it dropped, right, to um, under $700,000. Um, and then again, start crawling over back in 2021 and 2022. So you can see, um, right, the areas that, you know, these are two areas that we had a significant loss of revenue, uh, where again, the dollars um, were used to, you know, cover that loss. Go to the next slide. Um, but where this becomes, I think, significantly um, important for, you know, the agency and, and how we looked at utilizing the dollars, the dollars that we got through um, the county and, and other dollars was um, one understanding who this agency is um, and what it provides to the community and I know often I, I take this opportunity to share it I've shared it with you folks before but understanding our significance even to the local economy uh, we employ actually today we employ 364 individuals uh, our payroll of as of 2022 was 12.8 million dollars it's 12.8 million dollars that are going back into the local economy um, thus, again, I think the significance of any dollars that we were able to utilize to, to cover our losses to figure out ways to maneuver forward. Take a look at the next slide. Um, you'll see even though as we lost revenue during these years, um, and take a look at one of our largest expense line items, um, and is that, that's payroll. So if you take a look at 2019, you know, 10.4, 10.9, um, 11.8 to 12.8 million dollars um, in 2022. And something to take note, um, in 2019, we actually had 388 employees um, at our agency, and today we're sitting at 364. So you can see, right, the increase of $2.4 million in payroll, um, however, with um, less individuals. I think what that shows is certainly our investment in um, the agency, but certainly in our staff and understanding that we're needing to um, compete, right, uh, with the rest of the economy. I mean, we don't have the luxury of saying, well, we're a nonprofit, um, right? People just come to us in droves because out of the goodness of hearts, they want to work for us. Many individuals do, and I think that's where uh, we're lucky as an agency to have those type of individuals work for us, but ultimately they have bills to pay, and we certainly understand that. And I think as we continue to go forward, we're looking at innovative ways to expand the services that we provide, even outside of um, accessing government funds, and how can we generate uh, lines of service or business that taps into um, funds other than um, that which is supported through potentially Medicaid. So real quick, um, right, have currently about 152 of direct support professionals, that is in the direct care, um, and there's obviously various types of support. One thing I wanted to illustrate, though, is in our nursing department, um, additional 12 people that we have just to support the medical needs, um, whether it's daily doctor's visits, um, whatever that might be in the care. And currently, um, we have four RNs, uh, probably the largest, I think, um, RNs, the most RNs we've had in the agency um, as far back as, as we know. So again, even investing in who we're having on staff um, as we position ourselves um, going forward. Who we serve, real quick, um, over 1,000 families in Northwest Indiana. That includes a variety of services, and I think oftentimes um, people don't understand fully 
um, all the different areas that we do um, serve individuals, whether it's in the educational system, uh, vocational um, areas, um, certainly residential in both our group homes, which we have seven, and about 20 supported living sites. Um, and then enrichment in our day programs. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, respite services. Um, go ahead, next slide. Again, I think quickly just supports what I just said. If you go to the next slide, um, many individuals don't realize that we are in a number, quite a few um, high schools, uh, working with those individuals and transitioning from high school to whatever might come next. Um, and essentially, we're able to serve the needs of any individual um, with an IEP um, and helping them um, and assist them any way they can, preparing for whatever that next step is. Um, and our, our, as you can see, there are 16 <coughs> schools. We serve about 861 students. Um, and I think that's the fairly significant and I think a line of service that is often um, unrecognized in what we provide. It's maybe a little less visible. If you take a look at the next slide, um, we are, and I think this is an area that we certainly support, you know, the community um, and small business um, is engaging with them and providing um, individuals to the workforce um, that are highly productive and highly meaningful for many of the employers um, within the community. That's anywhere from obviously a lot of folks um, can see our folks within Strack and Vent Hills, right? That is something that is very um, obvious, I suppose. Uh, but then we also place individuals um, at facilities such as Continental, uh, where they're CNC lathe operators, or they're working in accounting firms. Um, the variety of individuals that we serve and place within vocational, um, that have, you know, provide vocational opportunities is rather vast. And I think that oftentimes is, is missed. Um, we also take a look at the fact that, you know, less than 20% of people with disabilities are employed. Um, and, you know, our, our things, we're out to change that. We try to engage as many businesses as we, um, as we can. In that, um, during this time, during the COVID years, I will say, um, we started um, a division called VTAC, Vocational Training and Empowerment Center. Um, and this is a, a educational unit where we are providing um, post um, high school educational uh, opportunities, specifically, you know, starting out specifically for individuals uh, with an intellectual disability, preparing them for the workforce. Uh, many of the first students um, ended up working for us within our secure shred, our document destruction, uh, which we've since expanded to electronic recycling. The graduates um, are now, um, you know, working for us, and we again place some of those individuals in other workforces. What I think in here is important also to note and what it's given us the ability to do, this platform, um, and again, you know, utilizing funds um, kind of to support the agency and, and dollars that we lost, but being able to kind of look towards the future, this has given us uh, really the ability to expand our footprint um, to where, you know, whether you caught it or not, we actually um, are providing uh, vocational training down in the Indianapolis area. Uh, within, um, actually, it's the nation's largest electronic recycler. Uh, we're in their uh, facility with a v setting up a VTech uh, program to where individuals down in that area will go through the program and ult ultimately have the opportunity to be employed by individuals, or I'm sorry, by um, this company. So even again, as we continue to look at different service lines, expand, um, we're moving past um, even this, you know, this area. As we look at ways uh, to support this agency, um, in other ways, right? So we are um, becoming less dependent. And we're always going to be dependent on government funds and Medicaid, but again, how do we support um, our agency to be weather the next, you know, storm? Through VTech, though, um, we also, uh, with this particular company, um, uh, and, you know, through the COVID years, I uh, started a division, again, CIC, Corporate Inclu Inclusivity Consulting, where we actually go into companies and consult with them on how to prepare to become employers for individuals with disabilities. So the first step, even within ERI, was to get in there, uh, consult with that company, look at their handbooks, look at their training manuals, talk to their managers, um, right, and, and train them, take a look at hiring processes. Uh, to train them to become better employers, what it means. Um, a challenge oftentimes is can I fire someone with a disability? Um, and even that alone sometimes preventing someone from
taking the step into hiring someone with a disability. Uh, we go through all that, prepare them to become employers, better employers. That gave us the ability then to put VTech within um, that, that business, that institution. This program, this combination of CAC and VTech, uh, is actually giving us the ability to um, expand again even further and provide this to um, other organizations and companies. Um, I can't necessarily comment today, but I think you'll see very soon um, that um, it's pretty cool collaboration that will be coming between VTech and Ivy Tech, um, which I think is going to be quite impactful for um, the community um, and potentially even you know past this area. So we also have how am I doing? time. Yeah. Um, we also have um, our social enterprises, which many of you know of. Uh, go back one slide if you can. Um, we offer clean team services. I think actually this building um, we provide services for still cleaning. Um, kind of lose track of all the contracts. Uh, that's actually an area that's, that's been growing. Um, our Simply Amazing Market, um, that is an area which um, coming soon you'll even see some rebranding um, and re kind of repositioning of, of that brand for this organization. Uh, you may have noticed if there's a question um, that we're no longer in the Meyer store. Um, it's really because we reassessed what we're doing within um, the market, um, understanding that to employ the most individuals, simply having a small retail store was not um, the best way to employ, you know, individuals with disabilities. It, it was needed one employee to sell the product. What we, we've really done is um, is refocus to um, increase production, and in a way to provide more opportunities for individuals to work for us. Which means that we're looking to distribute our product differently. And I think here within the next handful of months, you'll even see um, what that means um, and where you see our our product. So certainly an expansion there. Secure Shred, as I mentioned, we expanded from simply just the document destruction to electronic recycling. Um, so now we, we provide that service as well. Um, and then this is actually an area that um, is that we're significantly uh, looking at its future. I guess this is how I characterize it. Um, is our um, outsourced solutions where we do um, piece type work. I think that is going to morph into something different. Stay tuned for. Um, for that. Something else that came up, uh, next slide please. In this, and we talked about um, in utilizing ARPA dollars also was to help fund um, a couple new positions. Um, fortunately, that did have some impact on the county as we hired uh, Walter Lenkos and uh, Nicole uh, from the parks. Um, but we now provide um, camp services out at um, our lakeside, our Lake Eliza facility. Um, which is really cool. Again, you know, as I say, it's it's really just a camp for kids. Um, we just have the ability to provide that services to uh, those services to individuals also with a disability. So last year, uh, the attendees at the camp were about 50% individuals that had a disability um, and 50% that did not. And I think to me that is an absolute success. Right? It's just kids um, being able to have that camp activity um, and play together, have these experiences together, and the disability really is secondary. Um, and I think it also is a, a great service for the individual without a disability, the kids without a disability. Um, it gives them that chance to interact, um, which maybe leads into right the school age years, deeper into the school age years. We actually had some parents that came to us um, that brought their children to this camp that expressed one of the reasons they brought them to our camp um, was to provide their neurotypical um, son or daughter, if you will, the experience to be with children with disabilities. And I think that absolutely um, says success. This now is year two. And again, this is something that we did not have prior um, to 2019. This was just last year. This is year two. Um, and uh, last I saw the numbers, we should actually end up with having more attendees this year than last. And um, we were looking to expand that um, even further. Next slide. Um, all that's leading to, as you're well aware of, right, the project that we have got going on currently at Lake Eliza. Um, the 158 acres that we own out there, we're constructing a new respite facility, um, which will then move the services that we're providing out in Jackson Township, we'll bring it to Lake Eliza, um, a much larger facility, providing more opportunities for overnight stays, um, having a children's wing, so we can also provide that service um, more easily, uh, if you will, for, um, for children. Um, just real quick, I don't want to get too much in the numbers, but just the significant need for that service in the area. 
Um, one in six children are diagnosed with a developmental disability delay. Uh, this certainly puts um, many um, stresses on families and caregivers, um, and these are some of the numbers through findings um, that um, they feel, right? 86% struggle to find time to meet their own needs. 83% struggle to find friendships and inclusive uh, experiences, which we absolutely see. Um, and then ultimately the difficulty finding a quality and available program. And when we're done uh, with this facility, um, you can flip to the next slide um, and even take it to the next slide. Um, when we're done with this facility, just the impact that we, you know, ultimately we have again to um, the region, specifically very much so to Porter County. This is right now a, a, the general service area that we um, provide is very much concentrated to this area. Next slide. Um, we do have some families as far as Lafayette that seek our respite services. Um, so even in that, you start seeing uh, our reach. And ultimately, if you think in this in terms of the impact to the county, it's you're now bringing individuals from outside of this area into this county that ultimately may frequent um, local business, whether it's restaurants, where there's gas stations, um, right, as they're bringing their son or daughter um, to our facility. Next slide, please. Many of you may have seen, um, right, our, our treehouse um, project um, that was constructed, designed and constructed by um, Nelson's Treehouse. Um, if you know Nelson's Treehouse, they used to have a program on uh, the animal planet, um, Treehouse Masters. Um, they concluded this project in about five and a half weeks. They wrapped it up about two weeks ago. You might have actually seen them in, within the community. Um, they frequented a lot of our facilities. And I will say a really cool experience um, that was conveyed to us by um, the individuals um, that were constructing this project this is the support um, that they felt when they were within the community frequenting restaurants um, and um, they shared who they were and what project they were working on and many community members um, were very supportive of and conveyed to them the significance of the work that they were doing and they felt it while they were providing this um, um, their service needs. They felt the impact. Um, so I thank um, the community and certainly the, the support received from um, the county and the commissioners. Uh, next slide that shows another rendering. I should actually put a picture um, in uh, because it is it is completed. And we will have a ribbon cutting. Um, tentatively, we're looking at um, end of August, um, trying to wrap that up. Um, certainly, there'll be an invitation sent. And then just to wrap up, kind of the future of, of what we're looking at at the lakeside property. Um, you go to the next slide. It's just providing um, and making that facility at the south part of the county um, when we are done, something certainly that is designed for uh, physical accessibility, right, for the clients and individuals that we serve. Um, but we're, we're speaking with individuals and contracting with them to take a look at that property, pro that property um, and these are some concepts to also take a look at how we can also serve the community's needs in that same space as develop programming such as the camps but more um, to where it becomes accessible also to the community to really to interact because we know for our clients um, that interaction is key but in a, in a space that offers physical accessibility but I think again the service that it does for um, even community members to be able to interact um, we're going to have accessible trails. We are ready um, through the generosity of the Cleveland Cliffs Foundation and a private donor. Uh, we installed two weeks ago um, a kayak launch. You can go to the next slide. Um, just quickly in a couple other activities, perhaps mini golf, um, ropes courses. We also have some makeshift ones out there now, but certainly something more complete. The treehouse is already up. Um, one thing is I speak to um, designers and our insurance company, uh, one item that is not an option uh, to take off the table is the accessible zip line. Um, we will absolutely have that. That is something that I won't uh, give, give on. Um, but you can see some of the activities um, and areas that we're looking at. Next slide, please. Um, you can see bottom left, um, that is what we have installed currently um, to give access to those individuals that um, can kayak, um, but giving them the suitability to be able to get into the kayak. Um, we've already engaged and had some conversations with some folks um, on the, I think it's called the, the Northwest Indiana Amputee Support Group. Um, so we've been looking at expanding outside of those individuals that you may think are the direct people that we serve with intellectual disabilities, but expand who could 
benefit from this. Um, even looking at can we engage with uh, disabled veterans to really make that property something that um, is really an asset both for the organization certainly but um, to the county. Um, go on to the next slide. Because ultimately what does that mean? You know, as we take a look at the number of people that we serve, we take a look at the number of people we employ, we take a look at all the support that we give to the individuals, um, small business owners, this is going to be another area um, that um, our respite services in combination with our camps, in combination with the future vision of that property, um, and we're already speaking with the you know, local tourism bureaus, the value of this location to this community um, in much further than, so if you imagine a three and a half, four and a half hour driving radius, if you will, are ultimately individuals that could utilize the services and that facility. We know that 53 million families in the United, spend, in the United States spend $470 billion um, in trying to find services for their sons or daughters. Imagine sending an individual to a camp, a neurotypical individual. This is something very, very similar, just that ability to have a place where, again, it meets their needs. And again, we start talking about that, that radius and that reach. You're having individuals that maybe it's the first time they're leaving their son or daughter somewhere. They're going to spend a couple of nights at a local hotel. Again, they're coming in, they're, they're spending money in, in, in local businesses. So the support, and we are kind of wrap this all up, and what, what does this mean? Um, that money that was given to support this agency um, and the revenue loss was also an investment in this agency um, for the future. And as we imagine, you know, what that is to become, I think uh, the Opportunity Enterprises of 2019, certainly um, today is different than 2019, and, and you're certainly going to see a difference um, enhanced um, services. Some things are certainly going to change, um, but it's absolutely an investment in um, to this agency in the future, um, and ultimately, um, I think one the value that we provide um, both to the individuals served, um, but that outward impact um, to the community, both um, in terms of economic development and uh, social impact. So, um, those monies um, were were much more significant, I think, than many might have realized. Um, or understood. So we certainly appreciate and thank you uh, for that support and every, you know, dollar that you uh, send our direction for support because it is um, absolutely impactful. So I hope that I did that quickly enough. Um, sorry to take all that time, but I just wanted to share with you the, the you vastness. So I just, I just want to comment. Uh, I had an opportunity to sit with a couple of your clients at Bun's Soapbox and for a couple of hours, we were packaging up soap and, you know, putting wrappers and labels and shrink wrapping and everything. And the difference, um, these cli your clients, they love to work. Absolutely. They get such a tremendous amount of joy out of working, and they, get, they derive so much meaning. So where other people their same age, you know, it's just like a drudgery to have to go to work, they love to work, and they take such pride in what they do. And it's just really amazing to see. And I think most employers, once they employ individuals with disabilities, um, right, they understand that certainly on-the-clock engagement uh, uh, can be significantly higher. Uh, there's less turnover. Uh, there's less um, call-off. Um, that they really start to understand, and this is something that we try to push, that hiring someone with a disability is not a philanthropic act. I mean, this should be done um, for business reasons. And I think when it's looked at that, um, you know, we have the ability to provide success for both the individual that we're serving, um, but ultimately the business as well, because the more often those relationships are beneficial for both parties, mm -hmm. the more apt um, businesses are going to be to employ individuals. And thus, we're also seeing that opportunity in that consulting side is, um, as it's difficult to, difficult to find people to work, uh, because the numbers are just down, right? There are th it's actually more opportunities, less than there is less people to work, um, is um, how do you tap into that force and make it um, successful, so. And Neil, just real quick, the, uh, for the people who, are, who may not be uh, uh, real familiar with what you do over there, uh, you, you and your team, um, when you say disability, it's not just co cognitive, that it could be a disability such as I can't walk, or I, you know, I'm missing some limbs, uh, and you help those people as well. Yeah, I mean, our, the, the, the 
vastness of our services, certainly the predominant um, predominance of individuals that we serve are those individuals with cognitive or intellectual disabilities, um, whether they were born that way or, or um, you know, traumatic brain injuries. Um, but yes, if you take a look at services that we provide in high schools, these are just individuals that have an IEP. They may not necessarily be diagnosed with a disability. They just may need additional help in, in, in providing that transition. Um, and, and workforce, certainly in areas and placing individuals, that is an area where it's absolutely um, a very diverse, you know, where it might simply be someone needing adaptive equipment um, to work on a computer. Certainly they have the ability. Um, yes, so the, the individual served is, is rather vast, and I think that is, is going to continue to And that, you know, and that's grow. always been my feeling is that, you know, because there, there was debate um, up here before we decided how we were going to dispense the ARP funds. Uh, you know whether to, to spend it all internally or to to put it out to the communities as well uh, to organizations like yourself and that you know my argument was always you know organizations like you're you're filling a void that if it, if you weren't filling that void it would come back to us yeah. in some way <clears throat> and uh, and that just has everything to do with the degree of quality of life we we offer our residents here in Porter County so I think it's I wish we could have done double that amount thank you yeah but you do wonderful work over there we'll send you soon uh, we have a new strategic plan coming out I want to touch on that um, but that'll start illustrating you know even more so um, future of the organization but even some of the direction that um, we're needing to head because of um, regulatory um, requirements you know things are are going to change and there are going to be increased demands on our agency to to evolve we look forward to it thank you thank so you. much thank, thank you, you. Thank you. thanks E911, and they're not clapping for you, Debbie. <laughs> sure, I'll, take it. Yeah. I'll play it. How are you today? I'm well. How are you? Good. We have quotes for a fire station alerting software. We have four four quotes. Quotes were uh, requested. Two quotes received. Uh, why don't you tell me about those two quotes? Um, well, I'd like to, if I could, just introduce my new assistant director. Andrew Barber. Um, he's been with the agency for, I'm sorry, how many years, Andrew? Over 14. 14. So he's come up as well. He is hes a tireless um, contributor to this county and to this center. So I'm, I'm happy to announce him as the assistant director today. Um, Congratulations. I'd also, yes. <laughs> I'd also like to thank, um, we have three of the largest fire departments in the county here who've come to support this proposal. Um, Portage Fire Representative Valpo Fire and Chesterton Fire. Um, this has been a, an endeavor of the county as a collaborative effort for years, actually. And it's just been this year where we've really been able to come together timing-wise, technology-wise, where we've been able to really push this forward and, and move forward with something that I think is such, a, such an amazing um, addition to the first responders of this community. Um, I was initially under the impression when I heard about this, having no knowledge of it, I thought that it would benefit fire departments. It's fire station alerting, right? And I guess we're the facilitator of it because technology, we're the hub, right? But as I began to learn about it and research it, I found the incredible benefits that it provides to the dispatch center and to the community when it comes to response. What I'd like to do, um, to tell you a little bit about fire station alerting, I thank Lee Childress for helping me today. I brought a couple audio files. So there's the first audio file that I'll ask Lee to play is an EMS call. We've redacted important information, but I'd like him to play this call, and I want everyone to pay attention to the gap, um, and I'll, I'll advise you when that gap starts, so if you wouldn't mind, Lee. 911, what's the exact location of your emergency? Um, hold on, I'm pulling it up, I'm sorry, I'm home help nurse. Um, Coats. Okay, repeat that one more time for me. Coats. What's the phone number you're calling from? Repeat that one more time for me. Tell me exactly what happened. 
Um, I just showed up to my patient's house, and I believe he's dead. Okay, how old is he? Um, he is 70. 70? Okay. Yeah, his son said he couldn't get a hold of them yesterday or today, and I just walked in. I just stepped in the front door, and I looked, and it, yeah. I, okay. Uh, so he's not awake, and he's not breathing? He's not. No, he's not. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does it look like he's been there for a little bit, or? It, yeah, his son said he didn't talk to him yesterday or today. He never answered him, um, but I don't know when his son talked to him last. I, had, I always call his son to set up appointments, and he texted me this morning and said that. Okay. Okay, so do you think he's beyond help? Yes. Okay. All right, hold on one moment. You're not going to hear me. All right, I'm going to okay. get everybody going, okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. This is the gap that will play through as I kind of demonstrate what this software will give you. CPR. Now, in this situation, unfortunately, this CPR was needed during this time. This dispatcher would have been during this gap. Dispatching the responders. Now, a very important fact to recognize is that every 60 seconds without CPR reduces brain activity by approximately 10%. This vacancy, this gap, we call it, is over 50 seconds in length. And that does not even include the initial conversation. Okay. Now she's back. So all of that time that I talked, okay. there was nothing. We're getting everybody going. Okay, so you don't want to start the DPR? No. <laughs> With fire station alerting, that's eliminated. The software, once a call is entered, we, we established a chief complaint. That call is entered. And those tones go out immediately. Aside from us, we don't have to build them. The software does as well as a digital um, dispatch, which now is it's the audible digital dispatch provided by the software that currently the dispatch center is responsible for. Um, I'd like to, I think another real important example is if you would play the um, fire audio that I provided. 911, what is the exact location of your emergency? Um, okay, what's the address? Um, I believe it's across the street. I think they're out of town. I'm seeing smoke coming out of the side of the garage. Okay, what's the address there? Um, I'm in the... Can you spell the street in there? Sorry. Okay. You said, do you see smoke? Do you see any flames? I'm seeing exhaust coming out the side. I don't think they're home. And I've never seen this happen before. Okay. And he's a state cop, so... Okay, what's the phone number you're calling from in case I get disconnected? I'm across the street from him. Is it directly across the street from you? Yeah. Okay, I was going to, for dramatic effect, leave this air dead so that you could really see how impactful this software will be to this county. As I'm talking right now, the audio is still playing, but this is the gap in service to our callers. And what's happening during this time is the dispatcher is building tones. This particular call was a coded as a residential fire and the response that is in CAD is a still alarm, which means for a volunteer to fire fire department, that is multiple agencies built into this response. So a dispatcher's responsibility in this scenario is to find all of these departments, all of these mutual aid departments that are responsible for the still alarm, and build them. So you find those, 
you create that from a tone screen, you dispatch the call, you, you send the tones, sending the tones, they have to wait for all the tones of all the departments, <laughs> then following that you get, to, you get to provide the audible dispatch. Again, I want you to remember as I'm talking that this is all a gap right now that the dispatcher is not communicating with our caller, you will hear the caller come back in, in momentarily, and service is not being provided because we're dedicating ourselves to what the software will take care of for us. It's, it's monumental. I think a very good representation, or a good statistic rather, to share with the county and with the Board of Commissioners here is that a fire doubles in size every 30 seconds. Every 30 seconds it doubles in size. That's remarkable. This software will alleviate this gap entirely. And that's why when I found that out, it was a no-brainer to me. Um, in our, I will continue with my proposal. You'll hear the audio come back up, but I don't want to delay this any further. Um, my proposal is for US Digital Design and the collaborative effort put forth by many, all of the agencies actually. Northwest Health was involved in this research. Fire departments were result, re involved in this research including the volunteer fire departments. So everyone has been made aware of the decision that we're, we're moving forward together with. And we found through field trips, through personal research, through um, demonstrations, both uh, virtual- Okay, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> fire department, I did. You want to go ahead and cut it. That's the gap that we were talking about, how long it took to build those and send those tones that will be completely removed with this software. So when she come back online, she was actually dispatching fire to go out there? She had already done that. During that gap, that's when she dispatched the responders. This now is a phase where she's in post-dispatch instruction. So she's giving the caller whatever, based on whatever the chief complaint is. So you can imagine if it were CPR, then that caller, that dispatcher would have to come back and then provide the CPR. Yeah. So I gave you those CPR statistics that this software will I eliminate. have a question. How long has this technology been out here? It's been out for a while. I, I believe, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, some of the guests here, but I know that they really did a deep dive into this, and I believe 2018 is when they started. Um, but there were delays, and then there were technological questions that we had, but now that we're in our final phase of the P1 cutover, this is, this is a perfect time to bring this in as well, post or pre-go live. Post go live causes a bit more problems. So the timing is perfect. The I believe that the effort put forward to the research is is perfect. I mean, it really kind of all the all the blocks fell into place at the same time very well together. So um, with that, we did reach out um, to four different agents, uh, four different software companies, and we found that the most responsive, um, the most uh, within our budget and within the, the budget. Of, yes. Was, was US Digital Design. And so that is, um, I did provide two quotes. I did not get two quotes from two of the other companies that we reached out to. I did provide the two quotes from both Locution and US Digital Design. And it is the recommendation of um, the 911 Center as well as the collaborative fire departments that we move forward with the US Digital Design. I'll entertain a motion. I move that we approve um, the quote and the software from U.S. Digital Designs for $78,490.60. We have a second. Second. So we have a motion and a second to receive the quote of $78,490.60 from U.S. Digital Designs for the uh, software uh, needed for the uh, fire station alerting uh, system. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Deb, I just real want to uh, uh, point something out here. I mean, th that's why uh, I asked the question: How long this has been out here? And, you know, I'm starting to see a, a, a pattern, um, and it's since you've come on is that some things are getting done that weren't getting done in the past. And I'm sure it has nothing to do with you being the first female dispatcher, but I mean uh, director. But uh, kudos to you and your staff. Thank you. Thank you. It has been an adventure, and I just, I, I can call it nothing other than just favor, favor. So I, I appreciate your support as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving along. Uh, Lori Daly, Lori here. And, you know, mo uh, bringing this up here, and uh, I've been, actually, I've been wanting to do this for a while. 
we, well, we bring department heads up and they, they do a request for additional appropriation. I think the commissioners need to have a discussion. Um, I would like to have one, um, maybe not today, uh, maybe in our next meeting, that whether or not it's necessary for a department head to come before us and get that, get that uh, approval before they take it to the fiscal body, which ultimately makes that decision. Mm -hmm. It's not our decision. Correct. Um, I, I personally think it's a, it's, it's a, a form of micromanagement management, and that's, you know, uh, we have a lot of confidence in you and our, our other department heads to do the right thing. And certainly if something, if there was a question that you shouldn't be doing it, that should be caught at the, at the fiscal level, not at the executive level. Or the auditor's office is going to catch me beforehand. <laughs> so, you know, um, with that said, maybe, you know, if, unless uh, Laura Barb uh, wants to, to add to that. Um, and I think that's m maybe something we need to talk about and determine whether or not we want to continue to do that. So mm -hmm. anyway, so what do you got? Um, we had a little uh, lightning strike, and this is the repair for the fire alarm panel. I didn't have enough money in a line item, so this exact amount is what is getting paid to communication company. So I have the check. I just can't give it to them, okay. so we have to go through the budget. So we got a request for an additional appropriation of fund uh, 4005 in the amount of $11,175.38, account 3620, building and structures. The addition is needed to pay uh, communication company invoice from the fire alarm panel repair due to lightning strike check received from travelers. So you have the money? Correct. All right. Can't beat that. See, see how funny, see how ridiculous that is to come up here and ask us. You already got the money. Actually, the check's made out to you, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's still you didn't say that. He's buying lunch for me today, though. Yeah. Is that just me or to the other two as well? <laughs> Board of Commissioners. Oh. <laughs> Darn it. I, I'll, uh, let's, can we do all these at once? You can. Okay. Then we have a second request to transfer funds, a fund 4,005 from account 3510, power in the amount of 8,000 to account 2230, food and groceries, to cover cost of food and groceries through the remainder of 2023. A third request uh, to transfer fund from fund 4,005 from account uh, from account 2210 gas fuel and lubrication in the amount of $2,000 to account 2330 household and bedding to cover cost of household and bedding through the remainder of 2023. And our fourth and final request is a requ uh, request to fund um, our fund 4,005 from account 3520 water and sewage in the amount of 2,000 to account 3980 event expenses to cover cost of event expenses through the remainder of 2023. I entertain a motion. I move that we approve the request for the additional appropriation and for the additional transfer of funds requests. Do I need to specify? That's good. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. IT Lee Shoulders. At Net Netco, a proposal for private fiber locations uh, locates uh, for 36 months in the amount of $9,000. That's 3000 annually. So it's, it was at 3000 for. It's 3000 a month. This is the same contract three years ago you signed. The amounts are the same, the verbiage is the same. Okay, so it hasn't gone up. No. Okay. You recommend this? I do. So you got you to be more excited about it. You got to. I could jump for joy and entertain okay, I move the audience. That we approve the proposal for private fiber uh, for 36 months with NITCO for $9,000. Uh, we have a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. Thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, development stormwater management. Chelsea. <clears throat> we have an NDOT plan approval for bridge 149 over Waverly Road, Little Calumet River. Yes. So, um, and I can have Martin, our senior highway engineer, chime in as well on any additional questions that you guys have. But this is bridge 149 over the Little Calumet River. This is a full reconstruction. And this is just providing final approval for uh, the bridge plans, the reconstruction plans, and your signatures, the commissioner's signatures, and the auditor's signature is required for this final plan set approval prior to the uh, project being let for bid. 
and do you recommend that you've seen these plans you recommend we approve I do recommend that we approve them okay. I'll entertain a motion so moved a second we have a second uh, a motion and a second to approve <coughs> the NDOT plan approval for bridge 149 or Waverly Road and Little Calumet River uh, all those in favor say aye aye, aye. those opposed same sign motion approved um, we have a request for zoning map amendment from a1 general agricultural district to I-2, General Industrial District, Petitioner Nelson Schoon, Project Ribeye, first reading. Yeah, I will uh, turn this one over to Kelly to provide her presentation and project background. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, so I'm Kelly. Uh, we met on um, June 28th, public, uh, I'm sorry, the Planning Commission met on June 28th for this proposal. Uh, it is a zoning map amendment from A1 Agricultural to uh, I-2 General Industrial. Uh, it is for a proposed meat processing plant to be located on 20 acres on the southeast corner of State Road 231 and 1,000 South. Uh, it's way down there. <laughs> um, we, uh, we've, we've had a petition. The petitioner is asking for um, uh, a favorable, uh, I'm sorry, the Planning Commission reviewed it. There was public comment. Uh, and they forwarded it to you, uh, to this board, with a favorable vote of 8 to 0 uh, for a favorable recommendation um, for this rezone um, with the commitments that the permitted use for the I-2 zoning be restricted to food production and processing and sale of agricultural products only, and also that sanitary sewer and potable water be constructed to the site, um, which would come, from, come down from Hebron. Uh, and lastly, that the development plan approval would be held, um, held and reviewed by the plan commission uh, to ensure that these written commitments were met, uh, <clears throat> as well as all the other uh, codes within the UDO. Okay. It, this is a first reading this of that? A, yes, it's the first reading. So I'm going to close the commissioner's meeting, open it up to the public. Um, anyone in favor of speaking in favor of this ordinance, step forward, please. Mr. Shoon, if you would like to. Oh, I'm allowed to? Yes. Okay. You're a resident, aren't you? I am. That's right. Just keep in mind that we're not going to talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, my wife and I um, have proposed to build a meat processing plant down at that location. We're excited about it because there is a tremendous need in not just this community and not just Indiana, but literally all over the nation. There's not enough custom processing for um, the animals that are being raised. And so we propose to build this one. Um, it will help two to 300 farmers in, the location, in our um, locale. It will help 4-Hers in selling their um, livestock at the 4-H auctions so that they have a place to get processed. We're committed to um, committing the month of July and the first two weeks of August to take care of any livestock sold at those auctions that don't have a place to go. Uh, we want 4-Hers to be successful, and this is one of the things that we plan on doing. We also uh, know that this is going to help th probably 30 to 40 employees with very high wages, uh, full benefits uh, that I pay for, health insurance, disability insurance, a retirement plan that will match. Uh, they'll get a, a hot lunch every day uh, because they're going to be working in 42 degree temperatures. And uh, so we want to take care of them very well. They'll be able to buy discounted product and uh, have an opportunity for overtime as well. Starting wage will be about $25 an hour, so very high wages. In addition, um, we're going to be helping probably 20,000 residents uh, with the provision of, of food. Uh, that they'll know where the food comes from. Uh, the local VOR movement of people wanting to know where their food comes from uh, plays very much into custom processing. And they can go to farmers and ask for freezer beef, but the farmers will tell them, you got to wait a year or two years because there's no slots available for them to get the animal processed. We're not going to eliminate that problem, but we certainly are going to make a dent in it. And, uh, and with the number of cattle that we will be processing, which will be in excess of 5,200 cattle, uh, not to mention about 1,000 hogs, we will um, be having a, a huge impact in feeding these people 
they travel great distances now to get fresh beef, Shipshawana, Michigan, uh, Lowry's in Michigan, and they are very much desirous to have something closer by. And so we will have a retail as well as um, the custom processing for the farmers. We will have a labeling system so that people will know not just that this animal was raised in America, but they'll know the actual farm that this animal came from. So we'll be promoting those farms as well as uh, Project Ribeye itself. So uh, any questions? No, we're not going to ask any questions. Oh, okay. So, thank you. Um, second, was that my first or oh, second? Can I, can I say one more? Sure. It's very important to us, too, that we be good neighbors. So that is why we're paying for a sewer and water line coming down to this facility. Uh, there will be no issue of us having a lagoon system or a septic field or any of that. All the water that we used in the processing will go through a treatment system and then into the sewer line. So we will not be contaminating groundwater or anything of that nature. So we feel that's important, too. It is important. Thank you. That my, was that the first, first. The first call? Uh, second call, anybody to speak in favor of this ordinance? Third and final call, anybody would like to speak in favor of this ordinance? First call, anybody would like to speak against this ordinance? There's a hand. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, whatever, whatever is best for you. Out of this, I actually have a bunch of questions that I wanted to ask Mr. Schoon about this, but I'll, I'll keep it super short for you. Did you? Um, let me ask you a question. Did you have that opportunity in front of the plan commission when it was being heard? And then I found additional questions that I wanted to answer. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, okay. I was there. Okay. Uh, my name is, is my name is Alan O'Connor. Uh, I live on uh, 663 West 1000 South, uh, about a third of the mile from the proposed project ribeye. Um, the first meeting. Well, after the first meeting, my wife called a bunch of the local meat processors in the area. Uh, every one of them blocks off time for the 4-H. Uh, every one of them stated that it's a seasonal business. Uh, every one of them stated that it's hard for them to keep skilled employees in the kill position. The harvesting position is the hardest one to keep. Um, the other thing that he had mentioned about six times out, well, people plan ahead. You know, a lot of, a lot of the people that they, the, the processor said, they stated, well, they're planning their kill before the calf or the, the animal's even born. Um, something else that really, and I'll skip all of my other questions. Like I said, I had a whole thing. Well, what I'm going to recommend is that you and Mr. Shun talk after the meeting. Communication's a wonderful thing. So I, I will, sir. Yeah. I will, sir. But I would you'll, like... You'll make yourself available? Okay. I would like this... Sure. This, this definitely needs to... Go right ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Um, all the neighbors that I spoke with after the hearing felt the plan commission had already made their decision to approve the rezoning request and that our concerns fell on deaf ears. There were a few things the plan commission members during the hearing, they stated, that led me to believe this was true. So I looked up the county code of ethics. Two of the lines run true to me. No county employee shall engage in an act which is a conflict of interest or creates an appearance of a conflict of interest within the performance of their official duties. No employee may use or corruptly attempt to use his or her official position or any property or resource within his or her trust to perform his or her duties or to obtain special privilege uh, benefit or exemption for him herself or others I watched the video of the of the meeting again a number of times just trying to get you know make sure I'm, I'm right when my wife started to speak uh, one of the board members and she was nervous I'll be honest I'm nervous and she didn't know the procedure you know we're all like family here you don't have to be nervous I, be honest sir I'm a teacher, and I've been working in education for 20 years. I'm used to people standing, you know, me span, standing up and speaking, and people not listening. Well, you're doing a wonderful job. We're listening. <laughs> thank you, oh, sir. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. You're doing fact, a great job. I had no need copies. to be nervous. I had eight copies of all this for you folks. Um, but anyway, someone in the Plans Commission told her to hurry up. 
she's new to this. She was standing at the mic, and someone told her to hurry up. Uh, I felt that comment to hurry up was horribly disrespectful by a group of people impaneled by virtue. During the hearing, Luther Williams stated he would like to come to Project Ribeye and learn how to grill meats. Mr. Schoon kind of chuckled and said, come on over, we'll teach you. At the conclusion of the meeting, Mr. Sims stated he was long friends with the Morrows, or sorry, stated he has known the Morrows for years, and quote, it's kind of neat that they are helping out with this as well. Uh, and I apologize for, to Brian, I don't know how to say his last name, Damitz? Damitz. Damitz. Damitz, okay, I was right the first time, thank you. Uh, pulled out his wallet and jokingly around, and, and you know, uh, well, I wonder what kind of credit limit I have that I can invest in this project before they voted. Or maybe put in after the vote, but after again, I have to look that in. Anyway, I feel these statements constitute a conflict of interest. At the very least, they constitute the appearance of a conflict of interest uh, for the benefit of Project Ribeye and the Morrow family who will buy benefit financially if this rezoning is approved because they will be benefiting financially. They're the selling the Morrow family is the property owner? Yes, sir. The, the current property owner? Yes, sir. Okay. And Mr. Sims said he was long friends with them, and he voted in favor of this. Um, I don't know if anything can be done about it, uh, but I also feel that these three gentlemen, and, and again, I don't know how, how it works, uh, these three gentlemen must recuse themselves from any further input in this situation. That's, that I, I, I don't know, again, I don't know um, what can be done about that. Um, well, I, let, can I make a suggestion? Yes, sir. You employ Mr. Sims. Excuse me? You employ Mr. Sims. You and several other tens of thousands of people. Yes, sir. Have your conversation with Mr. Sims. Thank you, sir. That's what I would recommend. I, I, again, I, this is all new to me. Um, you know, I got my little slice of heaven and... This is. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't think strength. Councilman. I don't think Councilman Sims meant anything uh, nefarious with that. I think, but it's something that that obviously but, should not have been said. Uh, but according to the Code of Ethics, uh, the appearance of a conflict of interest. I'm lifelong friends with them. They're going to buy benefit financially. Is that not a conflict of interest for well, someone else? I don't know that. I don't know that it is actually, uh, just because you happen to know Why somebody. Why don't we ask our attorney? Yeah, well, there you go. For it to be a conflict of interest, Mr. Sims would have to have a direct or indirect financial interest. Being friends with the property owners or to whatever level, and the property owners receiving benefit is not a conflict of interest unless Mr. Sims mm -hmm. is directly or indirectly benefiting and I would also remind the Commission that the Plan Commission is advisory to this board. The Plan Commission actually didn't make any decision that is controlling. They made a recommendation and yes, held a public hearing. The recommendation comes to the commissioners. The commissioners are the ones that actually make the decision on the rezone. So that's all I have on that. Okay. Uh, again, the, the, your code of ethics says benefit exemption for himself, herself, or others. That's others. What's what is others in your code of ethics? So um, there were other and again there were other things that I would like to have said in here that I will hold my comments. Uh, but so thank you very much, sir. Uh, you're and welcome, and, and, and sir. I really would. I didn't get you. I'm sorry, Alan O'Connor, sir. Alan O'Connor, Alan. I really would uh, uh, recommend you you talk to Mr. Chu about you know the current concerns. You know, the years I've set up here and, and periodically you get we get you know, cases like this. And there's a lot of fear, you know, simply there's a lot of fear of the unknown. And, but 99% but <coughs> of the time, uh, it's, it's, it's fear unwarranted. It's, you know, it ended up being a good thing instead of a bad thing. Right, you well, know? it's the, the, he, he had said that there are going to be daily delivery pickups of the, uh, what was the answer, what was the name? <coughs> Awful. The, the parts of the animal that uh, the parts of the animal that can't be consumed by humans, uh, and I, one of the questions was, 
what truck, the, the company that's going to come to pick that up on a daily basis, what kind of truck are they going to use? And is that going to violate uh, frost laws for West 1000 South? Um, so, you know, there's, there's those kinds of things that I was worried about. Living in a rural, they, they had just repaved well, this yeah, road. Right. And well, when the frost laws on trucks like that would not be allowed on it if it's a certain, if it's a, a, a certain way. But you know, the, the thing of it is, is that that is right there on that intersection where the, those, those two state roads could, uh, intersect. And you know, I've, I've also, I'm just speaking for myself, is uh, felt that, that this is really the state roads are, especially where state roads intersect, is really the best place for business. We don't need them in our neighborhoods. We don't want them sitting on county roads per se. Um, that they they just you know for the unincorporated area for county government itself it's just better that they're you know for transportation purposes and moving and moving uh, 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 vehicles you know uh, in and out of our transportation system that we that those businesses are located on a state road but I mean I'm not I'm not making small of what your concern is and especially if if the, that kind of conduct took place on that board sir. I have no problem telling you that's inappropriate. I, I, I would never, ever do something like that. It's, it, it's, I don't think there's, as I said, I don't think there's anything going on here. It's just, they have to, we all have to understand that there's, you've got a side for it and you've got a side against it. Yes, sir. And you have to be as impartial as, as possible uh, or, you, or you, you send a different, you know, to that other side. You now. Yeah, so, you know, uh, I would talk to Mr. Sims and I would talk to Mr. Shun. And the other thing, the access, the driveways for this business will be on 1000 South, the county road. Yeah, road. one of the driveways. Right. right. Both of the driveways. Both of the driveways. Schoon, yes. There will no be there will not be any access on 2 and 231. But they're 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 actually I mean it's a very limited uh, portion of, of that county road that they'll be on. Correct. Right. Correct. Okay, any other questions? No, this goes to Mr. Schoon, and, and I'm, uh, I'll, I'll email you. It doesn't need to be said now. Um, I would, I would just, strongly... I, I, I will make this comment. Um, we have contacted the SEC, and we were told that uh, they can't give us legal advice, but we should contact legal advice. They stress we should contact legal advice. So, all right, thank, thank you. you. Um, was that my first or second? Yes. Was that my second. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Would you like to come forward? <laughs> State your name. You don't have to give us your address, but the general area where you live. So I'm Marianne O'Connor. I'm Alan O'Connor's wife. So my. <clears throat> Another big concern, and I noticed it yesterday, driving down 1,000, is that the 20 acres that this project ribeye is supposed to be on is set high up. And then it's a big dip going down to an irrigation ditch. So if there's going to be all of these hard surfaces, when we get two or three inches of rain, there's got to be a study that's been done to show that the road's not going to flood. So that's another concern. Well, there wouldn't be there. There can't be the first shovel of dirt turned over on that project if it is if it goes forward, uh, unless there's a an approved stormwater uh, management. Uh, uh, what do you, what do you all call it? Uh, uh, a development review plan. plan. Yeah. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. You can rest assured of that. We get we get complaints all the time. We're too rough on that. Well, because we've so. we've we flooded. Yeah. So oh yeah. We flood. Yeah. yeah. We. Yeah. It used to be the Kankakee River. Before it got moved. But that's why we're that's why we're tough on that. Okay. So, okay. All right. All Thank right. you. You're welcome. Any. Uh, yeah. Let me let me do this. I'm like I'm. I'll, I'll take you next. Uh, third and final request. Anybody like to speak against this project, ma'am? Would you like to come forward? State your name and your uh, the area which you live in. Janet Veach, 716 West, 1014 South Hebron. And 
I also have the concern, concerns as the O'Connors do, but there were questions that really weren't answered. There's going to be 24-hour kiosk to 24-hour meet availability, so you're not going to really necessarily be able to have people go into a dark parking lot. So lighting was an issue now that we have all the LED lights, so to be that much brighter. So that and then the access to that on that county road, there's nothing from keeping those trucks coming from the other direction off of Route 8. That's a 12,000 pound load limit road. So that's a consideration as far as if you have semis or larger vehicles coming in to haul off the waste to bring in their animals because you know, you're figuring, you know, 1,200 pound cow, cow per vehicle plus the truck and trailer, you know, so now you're getting a little closer to that 10,000, 12,000 pound legal limit. So I don't think they're gonna sit there with a set of scales to weigh all these guys. Um, the hours of operation, because overtime has been spoke many times. So for us people that we live across the street, how does that affect us when, you know, we are a living role for a reason. You know, we have farm animals, we live in the country. So, and my other question is, is why DeMott has not moved forward with this project down on a state highway access as well? So those are some of our concerns. Now, if there's some we need to go over with Mr. Sh Mr. Schoon, that would be fine, but that doesn't involve the people who are in the decision-making process of all this. Was you, was, did, you, did you speak at the-, at the Yes, you, sir, I did. Did you ask these questions there? Yes, sir. Did you get answers? And I handed handouts, so- Did you get answers uh, to No, you? we did not get answers to those. There are a lot of that were just kind of overlooked. Like I say, is we sent certified mail answers on Friday, so maybe they're still coming. I don't have any. You, so. you, you mailed out? Answers to all their questions. Okay. By certified mail. By certified mail. Okay. That's why that communication thing is beautiful. Yeah. You know, it's if you talk, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things that could be cleared up. You know, it's, it may not, it may not change your mind whether or not you want it there, but you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be, if you're gonna fear something out of it, at least make sure that your fears are legitimate mm -hmm. or they're not legitimate. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I, you know, I would make myself available. Um, I would make myself available to them. Absolutely. Okay. I did at the planning commission. Okay. Did. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yes. Yes, sir. You got to stand up so I can hear you. I'll come back up. Actually, yeah, my dad's, my dad's right. The format, we all, you know, ask all of your questions, then they're going to answer all your questions. And it was uh, very easy for them to pick and choose what they were going to answer and what they weren't. Uh, one of the individuals whose resident, you know, their property value or their property line borders this property line, they did not receive a registered letter with the answers to these questions. Um, DeMont sent a written agreement on June 21st. They have not heard from them. The, uh, I say that again, I don't. The, uh, I gotta look at his name, Kane. His last name's Kane, Brian Kane, maybe? Mike Kane. Mike Kane. Mike Kane. Mike Kane, the manager of DeMont, sent him, sent Project Ribeye a written offer on June 21st. And as of last week, they had not heard from them yet. So she had asked why DeMont isn't going forward. DeMont sent them an offer. Well, that, that has, no, has right. no bearing on what this, this board is okay. considering. Uh, she, I, she, sorry, I just, yeah. that was something voicing my concerns. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you have another hand up? Excuse me. Oh, yes, sir. My name's Jim Bach. Hang on, hang on. I, see, we record these, and if, if okay. you walk up, you know. My name's Jim Bach. I'm not even associated with this Hebron issue, but I remember the pig farm that they tried to put in down the road from me off of Smoke Road. And I know the only thing that saved us was the fact that you guys had put in anything south of a certain road 
anything that went to Kanky River, you, you had to be city services, which costs, would have cost them too much money because they'd had to run from uh, Route 2 all the way on, to, on the other side of 100 South. I, I know what these people are feeling because I love the country life. I love the quietness and everything else. I don't know why this has to be put in so close to a city. I really don't. And to say that you're, you're being nice and generous because you're doing it with city service, I don't, I don't know how the water department is going to be able to handle all that extra sewage. I, personally, I think that should be well looked into before anybody moves forward on any of this. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Oh, he, oh, certainly he can speak. Sure. <clears throat> My name is John Spinks. I'm the Hebron Town Council President, and uh, we have been sitting around waiting for this to, to happen, to see it to move forward, but it is the um, it is going to be the thought of the Council of the Town of Hebron that uh, we can indeed process the waste coming from the plant and provide water. We've had our engineering, Wessler Engineering, look into it, and the system that they have set up and presented to the schoons they have accepted to do as well. So the water and the sewer is going to be able to be handled. Okay. Now, is, in, there was a, somebody had mentioned a concern about lighting. No, John, that's right. Thank you. And the, the plan commission, the, the plan commission addresses all that. Correct, Laura? Yeah, Barb? and and to be specific, that we have a fugitive lighting ordinance. The light has to be in is it one foot candle at the property line. It's like no greater than three lux. Yeah, at the property line. So we have that. And isn't it? Uh, what do you what do you all call that when it shoots straight down? It's, it can't illuminate. Right. It needs to be recessed. The light fixture needs to be recessed and downward facing. Right. Does this um, really need to be twenty four seven? It's not going to be. What, what we're are gonna one, we're going to have one shift that will be able, be able to handle the 108 cattle and 20 hogs a week. Okay. We'll have a few hour shifts that will be the cleaning crew coming in and doing all the cleaning. Mm -hmm. And there will be a kiosk out front that um, only has 20 lockers in it. So it's not going to have a lot of traffic as far as people coming to pick up after hour um, orders that they have made. And it's just to drive in flash their phone, locker pops open, they grab their box of, you know, their order, and they drive away. That's the extent of the kiosk. But we think it's going to be very beneficial um, to not just our operation, but to the to the customer who can't get down there by 5 o'clock. Which is most of us. Yeah, which is most. Could there be some kind of middle ground that it's closed from... 10 to 5 or something in the night? No, no, I meant, I just meant the, the, the kiosk and the lighting that's required for the kiosk. Um, I suppose that's possible. I hadn't thought about it. Um, we're just trying to make it accessible, but again, it, we're not talking about a lot of cars. Uh, and we're not talking about the, the lighting will be on the, the kiosk and not out into the neighborhood. It's just going to be the, on it for security purposes and for accessing those lockers. So we're not trying to uh, light up all of South Oh, Florida. I know you're not. I'm just no. trying to find some middle ground that might be okay. A, a kiosk out in their parking lot that is lighted through the night, very middle. Who does? I'm sorry. I don't think it's the lighting is a concern. Is the, the cars coming in and out of there at all hours of, of the night? Again, it's 20 vehicles. There's only 20 lockers. We're not going to fill it, you know, constantly through the night. They're filled at closing hours and notify the customers, and then they'll come down and pick up their meats. But there's only 20 lockers. It's not a lot of vehicles. Yes, ma'am, real quick. The other thing that we did bring up when we were... Could you, could you say your name again? Janet Veach, 716 West, 1014 South Hebron. Um, the other thing we did mention was the traffic. We have a huge traffic problem at that intersection of 2 and 231. 
my neighbor got rear-ended turning into her own driveway. We have school buses that are passed every day. The people just run the stop arms. We have issues with semis coming from the south. We have morning traffic from DeMott with a semi. The other neighbor just about got hit from a semi that went in. She was going north. He went in the southbound lanes to pass her and ran the stop sign at Route 2. So, you know, and there's big issues at this corner. We have to, when we turn into our driveway, you have to watch that somebody coming behind you isn't passing on their way to I-65 being that this isn't even I-65. But, you know, we were worried about the hydrant issue. We were worried about the annexing issue. So those are all questions that, you know, were other issues that we had had come up. But traffic is, is huge. And you're going to have daily trucks coming out of there hauling off um, non-edible products. And then you also have the trucks bringing in the cattle. He also talked about <laughs> tourism. He had talked previously that it was 100 cattle, now it's 180. No, 108. 108? Eight. Okay. So, you know, I mean, it, it, we're just concerned. Hmm. And we'd like it's to be heard. A week, not a day. A week. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, can, I get your concern. I mean, I'm really familiar with that, that area there. Uh, um, I mean, according to. Mr. Schoon, I mean, he, he hopes that this is a success and, you know, it's, it's a substantial operation. Um, I mean, it's not a super Walmart, but it's a substantial operation. And uh, whereas it's nothing but cornfield now. So, I, I mean, I, I, get, I get your concern. Now, I mean, but, are they talking green fence or anything like that, you know, going around the parking areas that, you know, you don't have to look at them? I mean, there was, it, I mean, I don't mind looking at the corns and soybeans. I guess that's why I moved there. But, um, you know, I had to go through many meetings to have my boarding facility put up for horses. And sure all do. we're doing right now is zoning. So they still have to go back. But now, my issue with the zoning that I had a question on, if it is zoned industrial processing, so on and so forth, then when it comes down to if he decides not to do or if it's decided that he doesn't do it, that label still sticks with that corner. Why can't it be rezoned back to egg? Because be. then we're just going to be going back to the same issue of I don't, get, I don't disagree with that. I don't in. disagree with that at so all. The way it's the a very the, narrow. The, the way the written commitments are put together, Mr. Shoon has not put to, has not finalized the purchase of the property yet. Correct. Tomorrow. Okay. So he has to have ownership, the zone change, and the sewer and water from the town. If he doesn't have all of those things, then he can't do this project. We would, you can't have an automatic provision to, resert, to revert zoning. It has to go through this process. So it can't be, the only nuance is, if he was on a contingent offer to purchase and that contingent offer to purchase fell through, the zoning could revert. But if this board rezones it, it can, have the, it can add, and they have, as the Planning Commission recommended, written commitments that have been put together that the, this can, the industrial zoning had been stripped out of all the other uses except for this, number one. Number two, even if those, even if this board approves the rezoning for those limited industrial uses, it cannot be used in that way unless it has city sewer and city water. So, effectively, if he bought the property and it got rezoned, and a year from now or six months from now there's no water or sewer, it can't be anything except agricultural. It's still zoned industrial. It can still do it, but it would only wait for it to become the food processing would be to have to have water and sewer from the town. In, in other words, it, 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 it can't be a, a general industrial operation. Say if he bought it, changed his mind, resold it a year from now, you know, somebody coming in there making steel or whatever, they're not going to be allowed to. Well, but I mean, a chicken processor could come in. And well, they would have chickens. to bring in sewer and water, and there's not a lot of people that would be willing to do that. 
-hmm. so they would have to bring it in. Is that fee going to be sent back to the townspeople of Hebron? Do they are they aware of that? Of what's being? That question? I said, is are the townspeople in Hebron aware of that? That the sewer system is going to be utilized for the processing plant three miles away. If this gets rezoned, then it will be considered as a development being placed on the campus. No. But then they can't change anything after that. After the fact. So you can still voice your opinion at that meeting. Always. We welcome. But the again, the only as, as Commissioner Blaney pointed out, the only thing we're considering here is the zoning. We're not going to, uh, you know, all this other stuff, lighting, any any fencing or any that's all discussed uh, uh, at a, as as this. Uh, program moves forward if it moves forward now do they make us aware of those meetings if <coughs> since we're really not mentioning or really need to mention those things here then are they are they joining property owners made aware of those meetings are you talking about for the sewer or are you talking about for the development plan for the development plan the development plan will be advertised and what about the sewer and stuff will that will be no. city is that the that I'm not sure the town everything store. is advertised you know, Where's it advertised? Answer your question specifically. You were asking whether or not the adjoining property owners will be notified. No, that is a county mechanism. Ours is to just connect to the water and sewer so it will be handled. It will be handled in public meeting. Then how is it advertised through Hebron? Uh, it is advertised on the website, the agenda, not specifically, and any of those particular town councils. And the same with ours, you know, all of the stuff that any of these boards uh, take on as business is advertised on our website beforehand. So. Okay, so some of the elderly folks, then, if they're not told by one of us, they have no access to that information. Well, if they get on our website, they will. But if they don't have a computer, they don't. No, so. Ma'am, I, I, I understand that, but, I mean, okay. what, was somebody supposed to, I, when am I going to walk in? knock on their door walk no i just didn't know if they had sent out they send out letters like that they did the first go around well they will so when depending on what it is okay. letters will be sent out depending yep. on what the ours ours will have mailings okay for the development plan yeah okay thanks yeah but again and i don't want to beat a dead horse here communication is wonderful talk and make yourself available to answer questions Yes, yes. Sure, sure. Attorney, um, can I break ground for this facility in lieu of the sewer and water lines coming down, or do I have to wait for them to be there before I can? You have to have a letter from the town that states that they have, you know, they're dedicated to putting this project okay. in and that those plans are underway, and that uh, any, assuming we get there, our approval would be contingent upon. City sewer and water. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And one thing I asked Scott while we were sitting here was if, if this, if you went to Demott, for example, um, and now the land is rezoned, would it be able to be a CAFO, which I know is not very popular in Porter County? Yeah, what? I'm they, sure. A CAFO, the uh, confined feeding operation. And Scott, you want to? Scott, it. it, it it's this, not the same. This industrial zoning would not apply to confined feeding operation. This is food production, processing, that is farming in a constricted, confined area at a high level. It's, it, it's, it's, it's different use. Scott, you did say, I mean, it's very limited, actually, as to what you can be doing. And that this, was the this zone? Yeah. yeah it's been and that was the recommendation of the plan department to the plan commission. That we have all those restrictions on it. Yes, yeah, staff's, re yeah, staff's, right. re staff's yeah. recommendations to the plan commission. The plan commission advisory uh, took their opinion and forwarded it to this board with the same opinion. And by the way, it was that CAFO was brought up in the plan commission meeting, and we were assured that that would not be allowed under this particular zone. Okay, now I've lost completely lost you, my space. You here. have got <laughs> to close the public meeting. Okay. okay. A motion to close the public meeting, open it back up to the Board of Commissioners. Um, any discussion, or I'll entertain a motion. I'm going to move that we uh, that we approve the zoning amendment from A1 
to General Agricultural District uh, to I-2 with all of the restrictions that the Plan Commission and the Plan Department have specified. And do you want to just list those real quickly? Sure. It is um, I-2 General Industrial District on uh, the said real estate shall be limited to fo food production and processing and sale of agricultural products only. Uh, the second condition is uh, municipal sanitary sewer and potable water shall be constructed to, s to the real estate for the proposed development of Project Ribeye. Uh, and lastly, that a development plan approval be held at the Porter County Plan Commission to ensure that all of these written commitments are met and that it meets all the requirements of the Porter County Unified Development or Ordinance. And at that time, would we be able to discuss ours if that was a an issue that would be a, a development no. issue, not zoning. That would right? be here. It would be here. Yeah. Okay. Can we add some hours that everything is closed to the public in the middle of the night? Yeah, I'd be I'd be willing to support that. I mean, I mean, Porter County Porter County is making a big commitment here in that you know we're and that's what. Developers need to understand is that we're taking, you know, we're changing a law here. In essence, we're changing it. We're changing a neighborhood. Right, we're changing the neighborhood by changing the law, and I, I have no reason to believe that the Shoons aren't very responsible people, and they're going to make good neighbors. And this is a huge benefit but, to Hebron. Yes, and it's a it's a huge benefit to Hebron, but we have a residents here that have some concerns. So, you know, if if we put we put some kind of limit on operational hours here to you know it's not that's not to say that that you know two or three years down the road that that can't be revisited um, um, but uh, I think it's important for you and I think it's important for us that they understand we're we hear them and that we're not just you know we're just not running this through so What's the recommendation of the, of the uh, operational hours for? Well, what do you think would be palatable to your business? I don't want to hurt your business. Mm -hmm. We can limit hours um, between 10 and 5. We can shut down the kiosk. This would be the only thing. Our cleaning you mean group, 10 p.m.? 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Our cleaning crew would still be there. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, hopefully not past that point in time, but they still need to do their thing. But you're, well, you're, you're, you're agreeing to shutting the kiosk down from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m.? Yeah. Okay. Can I ask you one question? Sure. Uh, you're going to have to give me your name, though. Deep <laughs> Kathy yells at us if we don't get your name. Okay. So in shutting down the kiosk, just had a question. If I put somebody's order in at 5 o'clock and they pick up at 10.30, I mean, but to a way, I don't have control to shut them off. It's either going to be, it's either going to be what Mr. Shoon just recommended. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just asking, I, you know. Well, can so we, we, we so 10 a.m. means 10 a.m., not 10.30. No, 10 p.m. So I let's, so yeah. let's say, well, then let's say, do you want to say 10.30? I mean, really, what time do you want to? Well, we can we can do this all no, night. Well, why don't we go to eleven o'clock? I mean, okay, because I I have to modify my my motion then. Go ahead. We'll, go ten five. we'll figure out a way to Thank turn you. off the kiosk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then I I would like to modify and add to my last motion that the kiosk hours be restricted from ten p.m. to five a.m. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. And if you folks in the future, as this goes to the problem, you have any questions, reach out to us. Yes, sir. Okay? You're welcome. So where are we in? One more thing. Uh, HWC Engineering Supplemental Agreement for Right-of-Way Meridian Road Small Structure Project for two parcels in the amount of $14,410. You can have the chair if you want. 
Yes, so this is uh, a supplement to the current design contract with HWC Engineering for the two small structure projects, one Mer on Meridian Road and the second on Brummett Road. Uh, the right-of-way uh, acquisition supplement is standard to all bridge and small structure design projects, and this is very similar to the right-of-way acquisition supplemental that you approved last month. So this is your recommendation? Yes. All right. I'll entertain a motion. I move that we approve the supplement ag agreement for right-of-way uh, for Meridian Road with HWC Engineering. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion approved. All right, is there any other uh, matter which would somebody would like to speak to the commissioners about before we close this? Yeah, of course. Come on up, Don. Hello, I'm Don Miller. I just wanted to say how amazing it was for Opportunity Enterprises to come up in front of you guys today to see how they spent the money and what they're planning to do. It was really amazing to see. It almost brought me to tears just because that is actually what this money was for, to help people. And it, it's great to see at least one organization. It would be cool to see if anybody else would come up, but that was great. We have them all planned. We've already had two so far. We have all of them planned for. Oh, that's I mean, that's, that's wonderful. So I appreciate that. I appreciate seeing that. I appreciate hearing all the great things they've done. So. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. What more? Hi, Deborah Silbert, Morgan Township. Um, I emailed the commissioners uh, my last little missive. It would take me 10 minutes to read it, if you would allow, or I can try to make it shorter. Well, I'm, it's not good. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to allow, I'm Tim, I, I'd rather not hear it because I've read it. <laughs> but all of these wonderful people here have heard, has, has just, heard what I read. Can, so. I, can I just say that our next meeting, this is what we're actually going to be talking about? But want? that's two weeks away, and I'll probably have more information by then because I've done more research. Uh, so can I just, one of the things that Scott and I did is that the Senate Enrolled Act 4. Yes. We don't opt into that. That is legislation that was passed. Yes. And really, we have one little lever whether we decide we want to opt in for the additional funding or not. Correct. But everything else with regard to that legislation, we have no control over. That's my read of it as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll, I'll just make two or three minutes then worth of, of comments. I just want to make sure that you realize okay. that so for people who might not, we don't have control of. I hear. Yeah. So for people who might not be aware, there is a Senate Enrolled Act um, Bit 4, which is a bill concerning public health. And so what, what Commissioner Regnitz was just saying was that the way the legislation is written is, is went into effect July 1st. And um, if you have not read the text of the legislation, I would encourage you to do that because there's a, a great deal um, to be concerned about. Um, we, the county commissioners will be voting. Will you be voting on, at the next meeting or not yet? I don't know. Okay, so the county commissioners need to vote on whether or not to opt in to the additional funding that's available and the additional funding that's available to the local public health board is, is huge. Um, it's a lot of money. Um, my position is that we should not opt in um, to this. I, so the points I just want to make today are, are as follows. Um, Porter County, currently I looked up the statistics on this, we are ranked amongst the healthiest counties in Indiana. We ranked ninth out of 92 counties, that's the top 9% in uh, 2022 and in 2023 we're in the top 8.69%. Um, you know, I, I don't know how much higher we can get with additional public health funding, um, considering the things that are that drag that statistic down. Um, I feel like a lot of the health department's um, initiative to push this funding through, they've sort of cherry-picked information. And 
I, I, that just gives me a bad feeling. I just don't feel like it's honest or transparent. Um, one of the one of the points that they were making was our, our health expectancy and our life expectancy in Indiana is 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 low, um, just 76 point. Uh, well, actually, it's it's yeah, two years below the national average is what they said. In fact, um, the life expectancy here in Porter County is 77.9 years, and that's in contrast to the rest of the country, which is only 76.4 years. Um, so I felt like if we are able to achieve an eighth you know, a ranking of eighth in the county out of 92 counties with our present funding as it is. And the fu amount of funding that we get from the state is really quite small. This legacy, legacy amount, it's only $136,000 that goes into a budget of $2 million for the health department. Um, I, I just think if we've got those kinds of outcomes spending that little bit of money, I think that we should be fiscally responsi responsible and not, you know, not just, you know, spend tons of money just because it's available. Um, I just think there are a lot of important issues not to do so, the, not the least of which is a potential transfer of health authority to the state because in this legislation there are, there's very conflicting language. Um, and not, not, that, not that opting out of the money is going to do anything because as Commissioner Regnitz pointed out, it, it, it does appear that the legislation is what it is and it would need to be repealed. But I just think that um, you know, opting in and accepting the money is, is kind of tacitly you know, accepting that this is, this is great, the bill's fine, and what I'd really like to see is for the bill to be repealed. So um, I would just urge, um, I would just urge the commissioners to really think long and hard on, oh, on we this. Oh, we have, we have. And, uh, yeah, I'll keep you, I'll, I'll keep you after you. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Th thank you. And you know, regardless of how we end up voting here, and I told you, I, I've been uh, very upfront that I'm leaning toward approving them. Um, but you have, you, you obviously have done your homework. And I, you know, I applaud you for that. You're, you, you, you appear to be very intelligent and I, I listen to what you're saying. But it's a case for me, and I, and I, I agree with those figures you just had up here, that we're a little, probably a little better off than, than most counties in the state. But I see, I see those funds that are taking us from good to great. That's what my hope is. And that's why they have to be approved each year. Yeah. If it doesn't, then we don't take them. But there's, there's not enough information about how or when we could opt out. And, we have and what happens about, you know, once the funding has been funneled from the state to the county level, how do we repay it? You know, there's just a lot of... Well, it is the it is the board of commissioners with the board of health, who 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 designed that plan. Not many people understand that. It is the board of commissioners and the board of health, not the administration. I don't know. I don't, I'm not seeing that that's guaranteed in the language of the bill. It's, it it appears to me. I have a real problem with this section 19 of the bill and section 20 of the bill. Section 19, which comes out and very plainly and clearly states there will be no transfer of authority from a local health department to the state health department should the county opt in to this funding or, you know, in exchange for this funding. It says that very plainly looks like an absolute guarantee and we should all be, you know, assured that that's great. But in the very next section, section 20, it's talking about how, the, I, I think the exact quote is that local health, the public health personnel of local health departments shall perform additional duties prescribed by the rules of the state department. Well, those would be administrative rules that are made by not elected officials, but administrators down the state, and those can be changed. I believe that. So here we have the state, you know, the legislation itself is saying the state Department of Health can make additional rules and it will, you know, the local health personnel shall be required to perform certain duties. I believe Section 20 was not, that was part of the legislation and did not, was as no. Scott and I were going through. They're in the latest version. It's still there in the no, what I'm saying is that Section 20 applied whether we opted in for the additional funding or not. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
So that's not something well, that we have control of. That's a problem. But do you, I, I think what I'm saying is, right, we may be bound by this legislation. I mean, it says we are. It says it was effective July the 1st. So what, what can we do? I mean, I don't know how that happened. I guess I was late to the party because I didn't show up until June 6th the first time and it was too late. But boy, I wish I'd been there earlier, but I, I just feel like <clears throat> perhaps we should opt out as a way of indicating our disapproval. Well, Deborah, one of the of things, and I think it was in section 42, this really is commissioner-led, should we opt in. In fact, the commissioners have three major responsibilities. Number one, we have to, we shall, it says we shall, in collaboration with the health board, determine what the gaps are in our county. That's number one. Number two, we as commissioners, in collaboration with the health board, have to come up with a health plan for the county. And number three, we the commissioners, in collaboration with the health board have to come up with a budget for the additional funding not for the match that the county is providing but all of those are the responsibility of the commissioners that's on us that's on us so you're gonna have to trust us should we opt in for that additional funding that we are going to shepherd that process properly and that we will in collaboration with the health board actually make responsible choices and decisions with regard to that. Essentially, opting in is going to more than double the health board's budget. We know. We know. Hard for me to imagine. And again, we're responsible well, for the budget. <laughs> we're responsible for that budget in collaboration with the health board. That's on the commissioners to figure out how that money can most responsibly be spent in our community. So and we're talking about opting in to double the budget of the local health board. Well, it's going to more than double. Pardon? It's going to more than double. It'll more than double, right, because the, the, the minimum funding available to us in here is 2 point, I don't know what, 4, is it? Some kind, it's over $2 million, and the budget currently is two, 2 million, right? So it's going to more than double it, but yet we're, we're already doing very, very well as county. I we're mean, doing, I, know, I know Commissioner Blaney said it's not good enough for her to be the We've been the doing best very county. well. Yeah, we've been doing better, very well for the state of Indiana, which is doing pitiful compared to the rest of the nation. Yeah, well, so it's I'm really gonna, not I'm okay to be the county. starter on the losing team. I, I want yeah, better than that. I, I'm going to say a couple <laughs> things. One is, is I think there's a lot of gaps that we're not filling right now in the way of public health that we haven't even haven't even discussed, hasn't even been discussed publicly um, that this money could help fill, uh, number one. And some of, that I've seen myself a, a, as, a, as a commissioner that just aren't being addressed because the resources aren't there to address them. The other thing is, is that I, I do understand this hesitancy to trust big government. I, I get that. And it, because it's in, in, in many ways, it's, it's, it's valid. Um, but Two things you need to understand here. One is, if it were the state of Indiana's intent here to take over our health department, do you understand that they can do that just by changing the law? They don't need us. They don't need a board of commissioners to approve it. I agree. They, they, they could have done that if that's what they wanted to do. But here's what I want to say. This is local government. Sooner or later, you've got to trust us. If That's why they hold, we hold elections. You know, we have to make ourselves available to you. We have, we need to ask, uh, answer your questions when you have questions, and you you know where you can see what we're doing here. That's what it's all about here. You 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 need to give us that benefit of doubt until we show you we don't deserve it. But wouldn't it be too late by then? No, of no, course not, Dawn. Of course not. What did of course you ask? it would be too late. Wouldn't it be too late by then? Well, what do you expect? Here, hang on a second. I, I got the floor right now. Well, I know, I know. But what, what do you think is going to happen here? Just over the last three years of the control and all of Well, yeah, 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 but, uh, yeah, I know. And, and that's what I'm saying here is that, you know, we some of us get really caught up into that stuff and think that it, 
that we're all, you know, there's some kind of hidden agenda by er all of us that happen to be in public office to do, to do whatever it is you think that might be done. Sooner or later, and that's what I said, you've got to trust us. If we, and if we don't, we don't earn that trust, then, then that's why they have elections. But I can tell you, you know, the, the, the people I set up here with, I have, I don't, I don't, I have never heard anything from any of them that would suggest, or anybody from the health department for that matter, that would suggest that, oh boy, let's all buckle in. They're going to be in our living rooms telling us what to eat at night, and it's not, it's not that. It, and it's, and I, you know, I, I get your concerns, like I said, but it's, it's difficult unless you, you set where we set. You're not going to see the issues that we see on a weekly basis that, you know, where people need help and we can't give it to them because we don't have the resources to do it. We just have to turn away from it. That's what we're hoping to fill here. That's all. I would like nothing more than to trust local go local government, and I'd like nothing more than to trust public health, but the last three years have taught me experientially not to trust public health in particular. I get it. I That's get why it. I am so reactive to, you But know, did you ever think for a second that the, the legislators downstate, they did this because they felt the same way you did? But are you... And they're trying to fix it? Of the governor's commission on public health, this commission, um, I forget the name, one of the one of the heads of the commission is is also the C, I, I believe the CEO of the of the CDC Foundation, the Centers for Disease Control Foundation. The CDC, I I have I have absolutely lost all faith in the CDC and, and, and it's, it, it just appears to me that this the impetus for this bill and everything all the way it's come down has come well you know, the, the folks that are I just are I just ask you is don't don't take out what the, the you know the, the issues you have with the CDC don't take it out on us Get you trust us that we're, we're going to do the right thing here that's all I'm asking I would, Deborah, I, I would love to see the right thing be the commissioners and the county council and even the board of health to make a stand just to say this is overreaching. Just to make a stand. I mean, I, I don't if we know. if we but stated that it was some... overreaching because they want to give us more resources. Aren't we on? No, the rest of the legislation that's there. Sections, particularly the sections that I pointed out, and I didn't even mention the, the issues of the emergency stock medications in the schools, and and that there's provision in this legislation for them to be expanded. I don't, you know. And again, that was part of the legislation that we have zero control I over. And I really encourage everyone that has concerns with that legislation to reach out to the legislature, because so even we if we opted out, yeah, two thirds of, of that, this is going to happen anyway. Yeah. Or it did. But it's already in effect. I mean, the legislation passed without, you know, like what what mechanism is that? What, what how do we have mechanism for us for, to redress? I mean, what do we do? If not to go through local government and say, can you please stand with us against this? Our state representatives will have an election coming soon. That's ultimately where our democracy and our power resides. Is at the vote. So it it, vote it, it's at it's at the voting level. That's how, that's how all of the elected officials are held accountable. Local government isn't going to change state government. State government can change local government, but not the other way around. Wow. And you know what? If I, if I, I no, well, yeah, all I can say is if I'm going to be told that I got to ride a horse, it's going to be one that I buy, not somebody else bought. But that's, so. that's really, that's, that's a very compelling statement that is top down. That is I mean, I, I guess I'm dumb. I mean, I guess I'm naive because I really thought that it was the us. The you know, I thought it was we people. we vote okay. but we vote all levels of government in so when i say the state controls the local the same people are voting the state representatives in as that are voting in the locals the same people who are voting in the federal officials are the same people voting in the state officials are the same people voting in our local officials 
So saying that, the, I'm not saying, to be clear, that the power doesn't reside with the voting public. It does. But once those officials are voted in and are sworn in, the feds take, it, the, the feds are in, for a broad statement, the feds are in more control than the states. The states are in more control than the counties. And the counties are in more control than the cities and towns to some extent. But it's the same voting public voting all of them in. Wow. Okay. Thank you. And, and the criticality of people getting up to speed on what the issues are and knowing what they're, you know, what the different candidates are, are representing. It's critical that people start to become more informed. And I, I applaud you just like Commissioner Biggs does, the fact that you have taken that time to, to really understand this and to express your concerns. So I do applaud you for that. Just say state your name and I'm Jean Woods. I've been a registered nurse for 47 years in this county, a school nurse for the last three. And I want to thank you for pointing out <laughs> we may be the healthiest county in Indiana, but that's, that's a small comfort to where Indiana is. And we, I, I worked very, very closely with the health department nurses during COVID and they're wonderful and we need every penny we can get to help the citizens in this county. Every penny we can get. Thank you. Very well, thank you. Well, if there's no one else, I'm going to recess and you all have a, what's left of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>